at CIA, you know, one day it's a nuclear program, another day it's a drug cartel, another day it's a you know person related to some important world leader, right? Like, I don't know anything about any of those things, but I need to learn very quickly all of the things that are kind of known. Then I need to ask a ton of questions surrounding that issue. And I need to constantly be attuned to, well, if we're interested in answering this big question, what are the unknowns and the things we need to know? I'm David Priest, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, November 5th, 2021. Only twice in history have two women who served as CIA officers been elected to Congress. The first time was 2018, the second one, 2020, both of them featuring Abigail Spanberger and Alyssa Slotkin. I hosted an event this week for the Michael V. Hayden Center at George Mason University's Shar School of Government, speaking with both of them about their careers, both in the intelligence community and in Congress. Abigail Spanberger represents Virginia's 7th Congressional District and was a CIA operations officer from 2006 to 2014. Alyssa Slotkin represents Michigan's 8th Congressional District. She served as a CIA analyst as well as a National Security Council staffer and acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. We talked about joining CIA, experiences there, leaving the intel world, how CIA experiences help as legislators, and a few pressing national security issues. You will hear Abigail's answer first in the discussion and Q&A that follows. It's the Lawfare Podcast, November 5th. Abigail Spanberger and Alyssa Slotkin from CIA to Congress. Why did you apply to the Central Intelligence Agency from your different backgrounds, and how did you join? So I always wanted to work at CIA. It was always my plan. And I was living in Germany in graduate school in 2001 uh, during September 11th. And my plan had been live in Germany, perfect my German, have work experience, do all these things to make myself more competitive for CIA. And then after 9-11 decided, well, if I know what I wanna be doing in five years or, or more, now's the time. So I finished my degree, moved back home, did my application from a computer lab at the time um, and, and waited and got, went through the process, got my conditional offer of employment, and then my background check process started. And that took a very, very long time. Uh, and so in the interim, I decided that I wanted to begin my career of public service. I had applied across a variety of federal agencies at the time in wondering if that CIA background check would clearly ever come through. Um, I actually started in law enforcement, which was, I think, a phenomenal experience. And and I grew a variety of different skill sets. Uh, And then ultimately, it took almost four years for my background check to come through. And so as soon as that came through, I got my enter on duty date and I started. Uh, but from the time I was a little kid, I used to write my my diary and code and attempt to do sort of secret things, mostly spy on my sisters. <laughs> well, we don't wanna know what ghosts were in your past that led to a four year background investigation. I just got lost in the piles of sure. rhetoric. Sure. <laughs> That's what they tell you. Right. Um, exactly. One word before Alyssa, if, you, if you'll hold on just one second, I wanna follow up on one thing there. The United States Postal Inspection Service is one of the least recognized arms of law enforcement and investigations in the United States. And I only got a window into it when I was training officers on intelligence and they asked me to come to brief and, and train some of their officers on the fundamentals of intelligence analysis. So give us just a couple of sentences about the Postal Inspection Service and what those officers do. So the Postal Inspection Service is the oldest law enforcement agency in the country, there are 1811, uh, which is kind of the, the code. So FBI, ATF, you know, carried a gun every day, had a badge. The Postal Inspection Service has authority over crimes that have some sort of mail nexus. So lots of fraud cases, lots of narcotics cases, money laundering cases. And frankly, every you, you can find a, a mail nexus with just about anything. Um, and so I worked out of the DC office. I worked predominantly money laundering and narcotics cases. But because it's a relatively small agency, and certainly in the DC area, things are quite active. You know, I worked some joint cases with other agencies 
and really got a broad uh, variety of experiences. But but my predominant cases were were drugs and, and money laundering cases. Thank you, Alyssa. Same question. Why did you apply to CIA and how did you join? Yeah, so I was probably different than Abigail, where I had never been thinking that CIA was was the path for me. I had really focused on international development and was interested in a career abroad, but hadn't thought about, frankly, hard security until I happened to be on my second day of graduate school in New York City at Columbia when 9-11 happened. And, you know, through that experience, really pivoted pretty hard and went in and became much more interested in hard security and making sure, um, you know, at that time, folks may remember, we, we didn't know if that was going to be an isolated incident, if we were going to have, you know, these right. attacks cascading for months, for years, and certainly the attacks that went on in the, you know, the years following in, in our, in Europe, um, you know, trains in Spain and subways in the UK and everything, it just, it, it, at the time, we didn't we didn't know, and national security and hard security became much more interesting to me. Frankly, CIA came recruiting to Colombia. It was right after 9-11, and because I'd had, at that point, four or five years of Arabic, my favorite professor signed me up for a recruiting event, and I didn't want to insult him, you know, and so I, I <laughs> went to the event. And actually, the analysts, I, I should figure out which analysts it were that came up to Columbia because it was the conversation with the analysts who that really convinced me that CIA was something that I wanted to seriously consider. And in particular, understanding that um, most people felt very strongly about speaking truth to power, about saying what was really going on. Um, obviously, I was talking to a lot of Middle East focused folks right in the run up to the Iraq war. And they right. were speaking frankly about how they felt about that. And then understanding that when they produce intelligence, at the end of the day, even the most junior analyst had a veto on what that final PDB looked like, what that final serial flyer looked like, that I thought was important to me. So I applied and three weeks later got the conditional offer and my process took about nine months. Um, so more normal than four years. And, you know, I, I know we'll talk about this, but I, I use my training every single day in my life as a congressperson and um, and feel that training very firmly in the work that we're required to do here. Let, let me ask you, you said you were studying Arabic before this meeting with the analysts and before the real pull to come into the Central Intelligence Agency. So what was driving you to that? What was your interest in the Arabic language and presumably studies surrounding something having to do with the Arab world? Yeah, so I, again, international development was where I thought I was going to put most of my time. So I had already, you know, spent my junior year abroad, went back after college and worked abroad, mostly in East Africa, uh, but became more and more interested in the Middle East, worked between um, Israel and the Palestinian territories, went to the American University of Cairo to do an intensive Arabic program. So I just felt that I was going to do more of a, I don't know, State Department or USAID world or a nonprofit, a big nonprofit organization. And that just changed dramatically after 9-11. Um, but I still had taken the language for many, many years. And, you know, I remember my, my parents who at the time before 9-11 had no idea why like a girl from Michigan was learning Arabic and, and, wanting to do that and then of course thought I was brilliant after 9-11 because the skill set was was desperately needed in the government. Yep. You were ahead of your time as opposed to someone else who was learning German. I, I don't want to try to wonder why but uh, perfecting her German. <laughs> perfecting her German. That's right. Um, and I don't know I, I know for certain that you used the Arabic on the job that that was useful for you in several cases, especially in Iraq itself. Abigail did you use German once you got into the agency? She did. When my trains canceled on me and I had to yeah. uh, reroute myself on my way to meet people abroad, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. There you go. There you go. You never know what will help because we're already getting questions about languages and how useful they are. And that's one of the, the funny things is the language might be useful for core job duties or it might be useful incidentally during a TDY or something that you never expected that, that it would come up. More incidentally. Yeah, we all, we all love stories. So 
within the limits that we have of classification and of things that are still uh, secret for sources and methods reasons, I'm hoping that each of you can share what your, your most favorite or your most impactful experience was while you were at CIA before you decided to, to leave for other types of work. Abigail, start us off. So I, I'm, because you asked about the German, this is not necessarily a, a, an operations related story, but I was out for meetings and was doing, had a long surveillance detection route. And in part of that, I had to rent a car and take a train, do a variety of different things. And, and so at CIA, you train for everything, right? Like you plan for everything and you're ready for everything. And you, know, you go through your plan for the meeting and the things you're gonna talk about and go through all of the kind of collection priorities and you plan how you're gonna to get to the meeting, all of these things. And I had been very purposeful in requesting an automatic car because that felt like a really important aspect. Um, but I of course got there in the midst of my route that's precisely timed, et cetera. And they only had stick shift cars. But because CIA makes you train for everything, I sort of took a deep breath. And I said, okay, well, I'm trained for this. <laughs> and um, and proceeded to do just fine driving through a foreign country in stop and go traffic and made it to all the places I needed to go. Um, so you know, I, I think to Alyssa's point about like using it every day, even just the skill set of the I can do this. It is, is important. But I, I think beyond that, you know, I had the experience of meeting incredible people who communicated information to the United States for a whole host of reasons and a variety of motivations. And so being able to have conversations with other people who think that the information they're sharing and that the things they're talking to you about are vitally important to our government, to the mm -hmm. positive relationships that exist in the world. There's something really humbling, interesting, affirming about the fact that, that people are willing to take those sorts of risks to do right in the world and to help yeah. in the world. And so uh, sometimes on days when things can be a little bit frustrating, I think about those who take significant risks to do what they think is right. Yeah, without revealing any details, I'm looking for a simple answer here. Are you confident when you look at yourself in the mirror and you look in your eyes that some of your work with, with assets in the field actually did make a significant contribution to U.S. national security? I believe so. Yeah. And that's, that's a feeling that, that it doesn't go away because, right, that, that was work you and a whole lot of people supporting you put in to make that meeting happen, to get the requirements to do everything that was needed. Unfortunately, those are stories that may never be told because that, that specific contribution is something that you might not be able to brag about, but you can still feel good about. And when you, you get the notification that information you provided contributed to the PDB. Yeah. And you know, frankly, to be able to go back and tell someone the things you told me because you think it's important to share it. And because, you know, also I knew to ask these sorts of follow-up questions that made it particularly helpful, like that made it in front of our president's eyes or that made it in front of people who really needed to see it eyes. Absolutely. Okay, mm -hmm. Alyssa, what was your uh, most impactful career moment or your favorite moment looking back at what you accomplished while you were at CIA? There are two very, two very different things. One was, you know, I was working on Iraq. And I think one lesson, certainly for the analysts at CIA, is like if you're working a war zone account, an account that's extremely busy, extremely important to the senior leaders, you're going to get opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise get if you were working on a, a quieter account, right? So, um, you know, I wrote my first PDB the third week I was at CIA. Now that's unusual but we desperately needed analysts who understood something more than just Saddam Hussein's family, which is what most Iraq analysts before my time were expert at. And then they were gone and they were hunting for Saddam. And those of us who understood a different group were coming in. I was able to lead a, basically an analytic team of a bunch of different analysts, experts on different things, military uh, uh, armaments, uh, leadership analysts. And we went out and 
spent, I think, four months in Baghdad, and we were doing some of the original analysis linking Shia militia groups to Iran and understanding how these groups were getting weapons, money, training, leadership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the, at the time, um, that was an issue that was hotly debated and understanding what we wanted to do vis-a-vis -vis Iran was pretty important to, at that point, President Bush. So we, I thought that was a very impactful experience. And then frankly, um, when our strategy was going the wrong direction in Iraq, I feel like a lot of CIA analysis helped President Bush steer into a different strategy. And I will never forget when he decided to surge in Iraq, controversial decision, um, and double down and um, really do kind of the counterinsurgency model that we now take as normal. He uh, changed his Secretary of Defense and he said, you know what, I've been insulated from what's really going on. I want to see young CIA analysts in the Oval Office every Monday without their bosses. So here I am, at, I am I'm in my 20s, uh, maybe very early 30s, and my manager got us together and said, the word has come down that the president wants to see young analysts without their bosses, you know, briefing their pieces directly to the president. Who wants to go? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I mean, this is like why you sign up, right? And I went down and briefed my piece on a particular militia group and had a healthy debate with the president and the vice president and the national security advisor about what to do about a certain militia leader, right? And it was respectful and decent, but we had a debate. And I walked out of the Oval Office and, you know, uh, one of the members, one of the senior leaders who had been in the room said, if you can argue with the president and not piss him off, you should come and work here. And a week later, I was an Iraq director at the NSC. So that to me um, felt like an impactful moment that led to more impactful opportunities. That's way better than my <laughs> stick shift story. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an amazing experience, especially for, for students who are considering a career in intelligence, because your story is remarkable, but it is not unique. It is partially a function of George W. Bush, who chose to make deep dives and regular sessions with analysts a part of his, his weekly and almost daily experience in the second term. But other presidents have also invited intelligence analysts in, and you can have a debate with the president of the United States about an issue on which you've become an expert, but he really needs that information to narrow the range of uncertainty for the decisions that he and eventually she has to make as commander in chief. So passing that experience forward, is that something when people ask you, should I apply to the CIA? Is that a story that you tell to say, yeah, you can have some real impact? Absolutely. And I think between the training that it provides, the analytic training, the writing and briefing training that it provides, the opportunities that it provides, and you know, for uh, young people who are looking to make a difference and have a voice in the conversation, um, you know, it's not every day that I was going to the Oval Office, but we were certainly writing for the president all the time. The feedback every day from people like you who were briefing those pieces directly to the president. That is, I mean, when you're a young person, if you're willing to like really dig in and become the expert on that particular issue, I don't know another opportunity like it. Right. So it raises the question, if that's the opportunity and if you're that jazzed about it, why did you leave to go do a policy job, which is largely a thankless one? So, I, <laughs> um, I've, I've, you, one could say I've made success, successive bad career choices <laughs> in leaving CIA to go to the Pentagon and Pentagon to go to Congress. But I will say that for, I always describe it this way for young people who are wondering whether they should go into intelligence or policy making. Intelligence is getting to deep dive into something you care about, becoming the expert, having time every morning to wake up and basically looking at the classified Google at what's come in overnight, piecing things together, telling that story. But at the end of the day, you're not the decision maker. And actually you are trained to not give your opinion on what policy choices should be taken. That's not right. the role of the CIA, certainly at the, the analyst level. But the CIA gave me opportunities to be at places like the NSC and the DNI's office and the State Department through rotations. And I lived in the policy world. 
And the policy world is fast paced. It's an inch deep and a mile wide. It is being able to very succinctly explain to very senior people what they need to know to make informed decisions. And I always tell people that if you're the kind of student who is given a paper assignment at the in your college class in January, and it's one grade you're going to get for that paper, and it's due in May, how do you do that paper? Do you methodically start going to the library in February and start reading books and start building your outline? And by March, you have a general outline. In April, you're writing and you turn in the paper, a perfect paper, a couple of days ahead of time and get an A. That's an analyst. That's an analyst. Um, and an analyst on, on something that's not maybe a war zone issue. But if you are like me and you think and remind yourself you should go to the library in March, but you don't really get there. In April, you start to get there. End of April, you generally have an outline and you're pulling an all-nighter to turn it in and you still get an A, you're, you're a policy person and you need the adrenaline to do your best work. And that, I think, for me, is the fundamental difference on who should point themselves towards which career on the analyst side. And, you know, I, I think that has direct relevance to some of your congressional experiences, but we're going to come back to that. Abigail, why, why did you choose to leave the CIA and then ultimately run for Congress? So I left CIA in, in 2014, and we were, we were kind of at a pivot point with um, leaving my family, my husband and I. And at one point in time, we were talking about where we were bidding for the places we were putting in for our next assignment. And my daughter at one point said, oh, well, we should go to, we should go to Richmond. You know, all, all of our families in Richmond. And I did a lot of soul searching. I had grown up in a household. My father had been career law enforcement. My mother was a nurse. And so our whole focus was service to country, but service to community. And I loved the adrenaline, the excitement, the change of CIA. But I was kind of at that point of, do I want to do this for the entirety of my future? So my kids, you know, every two to three years we move, we go back and visit family when we can, which is exciting to me and something that, you know, always attracted me to CIA, but then seeing the other people where I thought, you know, we're in a situation where my, my husband and I are both from the Richmond area. So our family's all in the same place. And my daughter even said, well, why wouldn't we go to Richmond? Everyone we love lives there. And I, I spent a lot of time thinking, you know, where do I want to be in 10 years? Where do I want to be in 20 years? <laughs> it was not Congress, <laughs> but it was, well, maybe I can take my love of country and my desire to serve in this way and bring it back to my community. And so I decided that that's what we we're going to do. And so we moved home and I got a job in the private sector, but I really focused on engaging in the community and I got involved with advocacy that mattered to me. And I started a Girl Scout troop and I really thought that was going to be where I was going to sort of dig into things. And, and so that ultimately didn't last for a very long time. And, and, you know, it's, I love the job. It's a piece of you when it's, when everything like the nicknames you call your friends by, the people you have to ignore if you bump into them in public, like the, the way you live your life, the way, you know, I was on an anniversary dinner with my husband one year and I tuned into a conversation that was happening at the table nearby. And I just said, we're gonna need to not really talk that much because <laughs> sorry, but I think we just lucked out and I need to, need to keep tabs on what's happening. Like things like that where you can't ever turn it off. And I, I miss that, but it, it's, a, it's an extraordinary career. And so, you know, it was a, it was a hard choice to, to leave, but it was, it was the right one for me at the time. But the, the skill sets that you develop and the, the experience that conveys, you, you carry that with you and apply it to a different domain. In this case, representing what 700,000 some people in the United States Congress. Now, except for a few very special districts, Northern Virginia, Central Maryland, and a few other isolated places, you're not actually talking to constituents who primarily care about intelligence community experience. They care about 
issues of jobs. They care about issues of healthcare. They care about things more than the fact that you worked at the CIA. So Abigail, and then Alyssa as well, how did the experiences you gained as an intelligence officer help you in the business of both representing people and working with colleagues to achieve good in this big, ugly government we have? So I think that the skill set, right? So as, as a case officer, the whole goal that you have is to look at an array of information, you know, learn from analysts, learn from reports officers, what are the questions that we still have about a particular issue? What do we know about a particular issue? And you have to learn a lot. You have to read the requirements and understand an issue because it's not just about going and asking questions that somebody you know, gives you. It's about looking at the requirements, what's known, what's not known about a particular topic, sitting down with someone when they mention a word or they mention a name, like having the recall to say, oh, actually, let me, let me go down that rabbit hole and collect information because you're trying to go back, write a report that will fill out information and inform people who are making good decisions. And so on the campaign trail, when talking about my experience and why I believed it to be relevant, and now in the job talking about my experience and why I know it's relevant, is that in Congress, we touch an array of issues. And a lot of colleagues will have a particular area of expertise and that's what they know. Well, at CIA, you know, one day it's a nuclear program, another day it's a drug cartel, another day it's a you know, person related to some important world leader, right? Like, I don't know anything about any of those things, but I need to learn very quickly all of the things that are kind of known. Then I need to ask a ton of questions surrounding that issue. And I need to constantly be attuned to well, if we're interested in answering this big question, what are the unknowns and the things we need to know? And so, you know, in my district, I have a very agricultural district and I serve on the agriculture committee. And I, prior to coming to Congress, I have no background in agriculture, but I have in, you know, when I'm touring farms in my district, like having zero background in this particular area is, is actually, fantastic for me because my whole CIA background is I'm supposed to walk in, like I'm supposed to read a lot. I'm supposed to adapt a bit of information. And then I ask 101 questions. And so regardless of the issue related to policy, you know, I think I'm, it's a skill set to say, I know what I don't know. I'm going to do my own research and then I'm going to dive right. deep to inform myself. I think it's a valuable frame to be very comfortable mm -hmm. jumping into new topics regularly. Sure. Uh, Alyssa, let me turn the question to you, but with a slightly different twist, which is how do you apply the skills you learned as an analyst, but also on the policy front to your role now in Article 1? But let me add in the question from Elliot de Groot that came in, which is how does the experience specifically inform you when you are receiving briefings or you're in a committee hearing? Are, are you a better questioner? And does training as an analyst help you when it comes to breaking down the information you need from people who are representing their agency or department in doing oversight? Yeah, that's a great question. And hello, Elliot. I know Elliot. I think to me, the core skills that are taught to every analyst, literally in our three month training program, when you come on the job are just straight up analysis, taking a bunch of disparate information and pulling out what's important and putting those threads together and being able to tell a sourced story of what's really going on. Writing, because if you can't write well and you can't convey your ideas in a thoughtful but understandable, digestible way, then your analysis doesn't get anywhere. And then briefing. And what I loved, I remember they videotaped us and we would brief and then get feedback on how we said um too many times or how we, you know, and those skills I would commend to any young person watching this, that you, if you could master those three things and feel confident about it, you can walk into a lot of policy jobs in this town and do very, very well. Uh, but I think in the way that I use it is certainly a, a group comes in and I probe and I push. But I think the most important thing is that CIA, the analytic side of the house 
almost takes like a special pride in not taking what's in the paper or what common thought might be in the outside world and taking it as scripture. We'll actually say, we know the whole world is talking about how this isn't working in Iraq, but actually we see data that it is. Or everyone's saying, you know, this issue in Europe is going to blow up. And we're like, actually, we don't think it's going to blow up, right? The, the most important thing that I use is people come in and here and they're trying to push you somewhere. They're trying to lobby you. If you're a, an official testifying, you're trying to get the members of Congress to believe that story of what's going on at State Department or Homeland Security or whatever. And um, that, that skeptical eye, that probing and pushing back and that that I have, I don't think either Abigail or I have any problem saying, we know that all of our friends in Congress may think A, but actually we think it's B. And that is a skill set I believe comes directly from being an analyst and just not accepting that common wisdom is actually a sourced analytic assessment of what's going on. Or even right. the, just asking the question, well, why couldn't it be B or C, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think that, Alyssa, thank you for that. I think that really applies well to the hearings side and even to the working with colleagues part of this. But Abigail, turn that over to the constituent side. When you're trying to explain something to your constituents and you're saying, well, you all believe A, but in fact, B is closer to the truth. That's a little bit trickier when you're talking to the people who, who are responsible for putting you in that position in the first place. How do you manage that inherent dilemma of speaking truth to people who want you to represent their beliefs, even if you're not sure that they're seeing things as clearly as you are based on the information you're getting? Well, so, you know, it's a, it's a particular responsibility and not to speak for Alyssa, but I think that we both take the responsibility of being accessible and clear communicators uh, with our constituents very, very seriously. And so, you know, be it in town halls, be it in group meetings, whatever the venue is, you know, ensuring that constituents can ask a question directly to me is something that's important. And, you know, we've done a lot of virtual town halls because of COVID. But there are many other members of Congress that sometimes will have questions submitted on note cards. And in a particular preference that I have, I think because of my background, is I want to hear the question from the person asking the question. Sometimes for the virtual town halls, people submit their questions online and then we have to have them read to us. But you know, on the telephone town halls, I'll have someone ask their question of me. Because Is that because you can pick up the tone and the nonverbals and get the emotion behind it? Yes, and it's important, I think, to understand how they might frame a question. Because if you're going to just write your question, you write the question. If you have the opportunity to ask the question, many times people will start with a small experience or they'll give you the, the frame that they're bringing to their question, which is really important if you want to answer it well or if you want to ensure that you're giving a very fulsome answer. Also, sometimes follow-up is also good to say, well, are you asking about this or are you asking about that? And I think that ensuring that we are, that I am answering the question fully, completely, and recognizing that not every question is a yes or no. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll have people say, well, do you support this? Yes or no. Or do you support that? Yes it's or no. It's complicated. And that it's complicated, which is, you know, of course, the, it depends, the CIA <laughs> the phraseology. It is, is something that people sometimes have a difficult time hearing, but to say, well, that's actually not as simple as yes or no. Let me yeah. explain the inputs that I'm looking at as I'm thinking about this decision. Or yeah. yes, this piece of legislation may be imperfect, but let me walk you through the, you know, the reasons that I support it, the things that I'm advocating to change, et cetera, et cetera. And I think being able also, I think as Alyssa was talking about that sometimes people have coming from the intelligence world, it's easier to say, you know, I know that people aren't always going to like what I say. And, but I have a responsibility to tell the truth, to explain things. And I'm not looking to please people. I'm looking to be fulsome in my response and, yeah. in, and ensure that they know that I have endeavored to answer their question, that I'm thoughtful about the legislation I'm looking at and that that's conveyed in my answer. Okay. Well, we are blessed here with some uh, really interesting and insightful audience questions, and I'm going to be getting to those in a moment. But first, 
I want to highlight a few things because both of you have some specific issues related to national security that you have championed, either as proposed legislation or legislation that has been voted on. And I just want to hit on a few of those quickly to give you a chance to highlight why these things are important and why you have chosen to make them among your many causes that you have quite clearly championed in the past. So Alyssa, you first. Um, recently, you've been talking a lot about revamping the strategic nuclear stockpile with an eye in particular towards foreign national, suppliers. National supply, national stockpile, not the nuclear stockpile. I'm sorry, national stockpile. Sorry, I, I missed, the, missed the, the phrase there. National stockpile and PPE and making sure we have domestic development and not foreign development. The, the experience of the last almost two years, I think, has made that all too clear for many people. But in your own words, talk through why the strategic national stockpile is something that we should be focused on, and more importantly, that we need legislation on. Well, I mean, look, a year and a half ago, I was sitting on the phone in the middle of the night arguing with a Chinese middleman so middleman so that I could get a 78 cent mask sent so that my nurses and doctors weren't buying construction equipment and scuba gear in order to treat COVID patients. And if a Congresswoman is doing that, our supply chains have broken down, right? And we just outsourced way beyond healthy and safe key things that in the middle of a global pandemic became really, really important. And we opened up the strategic national stockpile, which was literally built to handle, to be there when we had a thing like this, a pandemic. And we were all excited in Michigan. We were going to get our share of the stockpile. And it was a lot less than we expected. Much of it were expired. The masks were expired. And some of it was just moldy. And it was like, we weren't ready. And the, it turns out, you know, the, the folks who run the stockpile don't have all the authorities they need, for instance, to sell off equipment before and trade it in for stuff that's not expired. There's no transparency. So a state doesn't know um, how much they're going to get. There also wasn't a way for a state to set up its own stockpile, and there was certainly not enough American manufacturing of this stuff, of PPE. So we came up with a suite of legislation and built it bipartisan from the very beginning, right? We just introduced it with eight Democrats, eight Republicans. And um, when it passed the House uh, with an overwhelming bipartisan majority to shore it up so that the next time we're going into that stockpile, we're not deeply disappointed in what we have, that we're prepared as a nation. And look, in Michigan, we've been saying for 30 years that we've been outsourcing our supply chains on a lot of things too far. And I got, I have two GM plants in my district who have been closed for the better part of five months because we can't get a 14 cent microchip. So it's very easy to see, I think, supply chains have become kind of sexy in the past year and a half because people like the folks watching I think have finally realized that supply chains are a national security issue. Absolutely. And, and just feeling your energy on this issue, I can see how you've been able to make progress and work in a bipartisan fashion on this because, you know, you're, you're bringing both the, the arguments that you develop as an analyst, uh, but you're also bringing the, the intensity of showing how this matters to people. Just to flag, so it, we started with the supply chain, but then myself and Representative Gallagher, a Republican from Wisconsin, led yep. a four-month task force on the defense supply chain. And again, for the national security nerds watching, like it turns out when you lift up the rug and look what's underneath there about where we're dependent, single source to China for our defense supply chains, our homeland security supply chains, there are a lot of creepy crawlies under there. And the, the, there is a lot of things where we're dependent on China. And I don't think anyone feels good about our defense supply chains having even some dependencies on a country that many consider an adversary. So yes, I'm energetic and it continues into the national security world. I hope you realize when you say for the national security nerds out there, you're literally talking to the entire audience here because <laughs> yes. you've hit your crowd right now. Yeah, I know. Um, Abigail, we're talking about creepy crawlies. So let's turn to one of your issues that you've championed, which is ordering the departments of state and commerce in particular to investigate the involvement of Chinese firms and companies in various bodies, including on 5G technology and related issues. So briefly explain to us why you see that as an issue that you've put your weight behind. Well, so this, I mean, this like 
links back to supply chain straight away, right? If, if we are not the United States of America developing our own technologies, either independently at home or with our closest partners with whom we frequently share information, then we are leaving ourselves, our government, our businesses and the American people potentially vulnerable to potentially vulnerable to full stop, but vulnerable to the idea that they have no, that we would have no access to technologies that we know are secure, that we know there's no backdoor, that we know our information is safe. And I mean, when we look at the hacking offenses, efforts to exploit and extort money from American businesses, the shutdowns of networks of communities and municipalities, the hacking of information about you know, lists of government employees, all of it, the fact that we cannot ensure the security of the 5G technologies and supply chains related to that that we're utilizing is a big, big risk factor for some of the reasons that Alyssa mentioned. I mean, when we're looking at if we're dependent on China for the technology that we use in our day-to-day -day here in Congress, at home, in our businesses, we've perhaps not really thought through the risk that exists there. Yeah. One of our graduate students at the Shar School, uh, Isabel Rustam, asks, as a woman previously within the agency in a generally male-dominated field, what were your biggest challenges in that regard and how did you overcome them? I'll ask each of you for any experiences you have on that to help women who are trying to enter fields that are still more often than not uh, dominated by men, at least in some specialties. I mean, I'll, I'll start. I think it's interesting. When I started in the agency in 2003, there were very, very few women who had made it to the senior ranks of the CIA. I mean, it was, I think at that point, we had someone in the number four slot, you know, or maybe we had our, a female USDI or something. But it was the very end of uh, the era where those few senior women who had made it to the top were actually kind of not very nice to any other woman who showed up in the room. And uh, that's sort of, there's sort of a thing that, you know, we know around Washington. And luckily a lot of those folks retired very, very soon after. And I think it's totally different now. But at that time it was sort of this mentality, like there can only be one and I have clawed my way to the top here. And so I'm going to kind of focus my energy to sort of pressure or embarrass or, or really, so I, I certainly had that experience in the very first um, years of my time at the CIA, but, uh, you know, the intersection of being both female and young, I think might have, might have exacerbated the situation, certainly. It's one thing to be a seasoned officer at 60 years old entering a room that's male dominated. It's another thing to be 27 and do that. And my experience was that I just had to be absolutely on point. I had to know my stuff backwards and forwards. And that once I did, and I demonstrated that, I, I did not have um, terrible experiences being a woman in a male-dominated field. In fact, of course, because it's male-dominated, the vast majority of my mentors who helped me get where I am were men. But it was it's there and you know it, but frankly, CIA was much better than the Pentagon. <laughs> uh <laughs> and that's a, that's a separate conversation that uh, maybe we'll have later on. Abigail, any thoughts on this? Any advice for Isabel in terms of uh, rising above any challenges this presents? I mean, I think it's a matter of being focused. It's a matter of recognizing. I, I'm, I had similar experiences at times to Alyssa. Um, certainly as a, as a case officer, wanting to be a case officer, you know, when I had children, you know, there were people who... Uh, advised me to change my career track, and th there's some there's some challenges. I, I do think that you know my advice would be find the mentors who want to see you as a as a full person. You know, I would do the thing which I hope people are not doing, where if, you know if I was taking my daughter to the doctors, like I would say, oh, I have an appointment, I have to leave, or I didn't keep pictures of my kids on my desk because I didn't. I didn't see that my, my male colleagues were presenting themselves all the time as sort of full, their dads and they like this activity and you know this is, they you know, play the sport and all the rest, it was the job. And so I felt I needed to do the job. 
I mean, eventually when you have three children, like there's not really, you can't hide it anymore. Um, <laughs> and, and certainly I guess at one point in time, I guess to an earlier question about a funny story, like maternity clothes come in handy when you're trying to transport, you know, things and, and looking <laughs> kind of nondescript on, on subways. But I, I think to, for the actual bit of advice, you know, find people who are good mentors, yeah. recognize that there will, there will be ebbs and flows to things. And I think for anybody who's a manager, recognizing that people do better when they get to bring a bit of their full self to work. And that's not, you know, you don't necessarily need to share all your personal details, but recognizing that people have hobbies and lives that make them interesting. And, and sometimes that's a kid and sometimes it's a, it's a sport. Sometimes it's, you know, a dog or et cetera, I think is, is valuable. Um, let me build on a question from Alan Willis, another student in uh, the, the Sharp Schools graduate program about the Intelligence Committee. Now, respectively, you've served, you serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee, Homeland Security Committee, and you have intelligence related duties there, but you have not been on the, the HIPSI, the House Committee. So first, each of you, would you want to serve on the Intelligence Committee at some point? And secondly, has anyone from the Intelligence Committee, because you don't have a lot of people on the Intelligence Committee who have served in the intelligence community uh, as an employee, have any of them reached out to you for advice in terms of questioning or in terms of things they can do? So first of all, it's I don't think we've ever had a, a freshman congressperson who gets on the House Intel Committee. Judge it's, Schroeper's program. Oh, sorry, one. <laughs> right. Um, uh, the guy who represented NSA right, right. forever and ever, um, who it still does. Um, so it's very uncommon in your first term, sometimes even your second term, to be allowed to be on that committee. It's it's often considered a, an exclusive or not an exclusive, but a kind of a special treatment. special treatment committee. So you're, you know, you can't be on both the appropriations committee and the Intel committee because that's considered two really highly sought after committees. And, and so you have to really invest in being on the HIPSI. And certainly, I mean, I was one of the first handful of employees when we started the DNI's office. I was John Negroponte's special assistant. And so I'm super interested in the sort of issues within, you know, the intel writ large, not just CIA, but across the intelligence community. But I will be honest, all of their work, at least from my perspective, all of their work is classified as it should be. So when I'm trying to deliver for my district and I'm trying to get things done, and I want to talk about that, and I want to explain and hear feedback from people, it's not a committee that um, connects deeply to your home district. I get a lot more out of that, you know, in the Homeland Security Committee, where we oversee FEMA, and we oversee cybersecurity, and, you know, the, that whole state and local nexus, you know, that for me is always going to hold me back. Of course, of course, I'm interested in the subject matter, but I also am interested in connecting national security to my district and, a, and kind of having a two-way street. And HIPSI doesn't always allow that. Okay, let me move to another question from Rosa Smothers, who points out that there's proposed legislation for veterans, military veterans, to receive additional uh, PTSD support. Mm -hmm. And she's wondering if there's any consideration to include intelligence community employees and contractors. And if you would see that as something that is worth pursuing because of the similar situations that sometimes pertain to these personnel, not just to people serving in the US military per se. So I'll, I'll start on that one. I am not aware, this might be one of those hipsy questions. Yeah. <laughs> I am not aware of any initiatives currently to look at expanding those proposals to the intelligence community, but it is possible that there may be the beginnings and, and, and typically, you know, much of when a when an idea or when an effort comes forward, if it's particularly in this space, that would be pursued within within HIPSI, I think, initially. So it's possible that there are people who might be working on that and we may just not be aware of it. But that is certainly something to look into. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question. This one uh, gets increasing. You talked about national security nerds. Well, here we go. We're going to prove that. Matthew Warner asks about inspectors general and the issue that inspectors general in the last few years have had, let's say a mixed record and a lot of controversy regarding both 
how they've prosecuted their jobs, but also what they have been asked to do or not do. So what do you think of the prospects for reform of inspectors general across the intelligence community and the national security agencies writ large this year, and perhaps widen it out to the issue of politicization to hit some other questions too? How do you see the role of the inspector general in individual agencies and departments tackling this thorny issue of politicization and improper use of some of these agencies and departments? Well, I mean, in the Homeland Security Committee, we actually just had a hearing about with the inspectors general um, from Department of Homeland Security on some of the activities related to the intelligence arm of DHS. Look, it's, it is dicey business. I certainly think not only do we have to do everything we can to ward off things like politicization, we have to make clear and be transparent about how we're how we're looking at that and how we're we're taking that on so that frankly from whatever side you come from whether you have a you know a, a, an angle from the left or from the right or whatever that you feel confident that there's a methodology and it's systematic and not being applied to just one group or the other group um, or the other views when we look at these issues. And that's hard. Um, inspectors general are not the most transparent bodies in our government, right? They, they have to keep things uh, very close and secret. I think what was interesting to me was the government accountability office had come in and started to look at inspectors general. And I think that's useful, right? So that it's not just IGs kind of monitoring themselves, that there's yet another group of, in, of oversight that again, career civil servants who are looking at this issue but you can't get around the fact that you need a certain set of rules of the road in order to make sure that no group, no view gets its way into intelligence. You got to give confidence to the American public that you're warding off any politicization from any side. And the Foreign Affairs Committee, this is something that we've dealt with where there's been and publicly reported quite a few incidences in recent years where there's been some mm -hmm. alleged political retribution. Yeah. Another issue that's on a lot of people's mind is the, and we'll just go to the FBI and the DHS assessments here of the rising threat from white supremacist groups, neo-fascist groups, Alyssa, the kinds of things you were analyzing in Iraq, militancy within a domestic population. That's the kind of thing we analyzed in countries overseas. And now we're seeing some of those dynamics in the United States itself. What do you see the role of the intelligence community as opposed to domestic law enforcement to contribute to assessing and analyzing these issues? And to build in some other questions, do legislative authorities need to be adjusted? Do we need to have some, some new authorizations from Congress to enable the US government to work better together to address what many people are assessing is the greatest threat to national security? Yeah, well, we've been taking this on in our subcommittee on the Homeland Security Committee, looking at both the intelligence community role in understanding domestic terrorism, and then what, if any, authorities, laws need to be changed. And there's no, you know, two ways about it. It is much easier in law and in practice to go after foreign terrorists and groups that have a nexus to foreign terrorists. We've processed through this as a country and frankly, the mere you know, material support to foreign terrorists is enough to allow law enforcement in this country to move in and make arrests and prosecute. So we have a, a whole network that many you know, national security types cut their teeth on because we were sort of of the 9-11 era, right? So we have like a, a process. When you start to um, try to think about how to deal with domestic terrorism, it gets much more dicey because we're talking about our fellow citizens. We're talking about understanding and analyzing information coming out of American citizens. And that rightfully takes a very, very methodical judicious approach. Um, and the yeah. truth is some states like Michigan have a domestic terrorism law, and that's been important. Um, you know, the, the plot to kidnap and kill my governor came out of my district. The raid was just a couple minutes down the road. And we've been using those authorities along with federal authorities to prosecute people. But, you know, I don't want the CIA collecting intelligence on domestic groups. As a CIA analyst, I was rigorously taught to absolutely just step away 
if there was any question about looking at an American citizen or an American group. But the FBI, the FBI having a better, better handle on groups that have threatened and carried out violence, I think that's important. And so I, I think we have to be very, very careful. There is a, lots of open questions about a federal domestic terrorism law. But frankly, people, again, on both the right and the left feel like that's going to be used to target certain groups. So there's not a lot of appetite, um, including for mm -hmm. me, to push that forward, even though it would give law enforcement more authorities. It also opens up a can of worms that I think is really, really dicey. Sure. Abigail, let me ask you to weigh on this um, as we close up, because both of you have been very generous with your time, and I want to get you back to your business. But please share with us your thoughts on this before we wrap up. So I, I agree with everything Alyssa said, and I would, I guess I would add, you know, what Alyssa was talking about her background of tracking and understanding um, militia groups and understanding the leadership and who they are and the motivations. There is so much more that, you know, we as a country have historically done in endeavoring to understand like where these groups come from, who they are, who they interface with, without necessarily the, the obvious, the, without a law enforcement nexus, because we're trying to understand threats abroad. And so when you're looking at groups and networks that exist in the United States, I, I agree with Alyssa completely, like that is absolutely within the frame of, of FBI from a law enforcement standpoint. But I, I do think that where there could be the, the perspective of how CIA looks to truly understand before getting to the, and now we're going to take some sort of action, or now we're going to you know, do X, Y, Z. I, I do think that understanding those networks from the frame of an intelligence officer and a CIA analyst sort of mindset frame, I think is incredibly important because if we're looking at just the, the criminality and the actions that these groups may take, we're missing so much more of how do you take a step back to understand their recruitment methods? How do you take a couple steps back to understand what may be their motivations, why they're recruiting certain groups or in certain places? And those are things you need to understand if you're going to educate parents or build up resiliency so that people aren't drawn into these types of groups. We appreciate both of your insights. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please do share this podcast and rate the podcast, tweet about the podcast, let everyone know about the Lawfare Podcast. This episode is edited and produced by Jen Pacha Howell. Thanks to the Michael V. Hayden Center at George Mason University's Shar School for the audio. Sophia Yan, as always, performed our music. Thanks for listening.